Chances are, are pretty good that um, if you've watched uh, any TV comedy shows over the past 30 years, uh, you've laughed at a line written by Nell Scovell. Uh, and we're very delighted to have uh, Nell with us uh, today to tell her own story and to talk about her, her new book, uh, Just the Funny Parts. Uh, for a, uh, a sampling of at least some of the shows uh, Nell's been involved with, uh, you don't have to look uh, any f uh, farther than the, the cover of her uh, memoir. Uh, it shows uh, the titles stacked on top of uh, one another. Uh, there's uh, Late Night with, uh, with David Letterman, uh, on up through such popular productions as Charmed, Coach, uh, Sabrina and the Teenage Witch, Newhart, The Muppets, Murphy Brown, Monk, The Simpsons, and NCIS. Uh, more for a more complete list of, uh, of her credits, uh, you can turn to the end of the book, which contains a timeline of Nell's uh, many jobs. It runs four pages, and that's not including all the journalism speeches or half-written scripts. Historically, of course, comedy writing has been largely a man's world. And Nell's experiences highlight, as she says in the subtitle, the hard truths about sneaking into the Hollywood Boys Club. Uh, coming to Hollywood as a bookish Harvard-educated New Englander, she managed to work her way up from a low-level writer to major contributor on some prominent shows, taking on uh, roles as creator, producer, uh, and director. But while she remained behind the scenes much of the time, she stepped forward nine years ago at the time of the Letterman scandal and spoke out about gender bias on um, late night TV writing staffs. But then a, a couple of years later, she collaborated with Sheryl Sandberg on Lean In, helping to further public debate about diversity in male dominated work environments. She continues that discussion in her candid, engaging, instructive, and very funny memoir. As a New York Times reviewer observed, the book is especially timely, coming at a politically charged moment when so many women are declaring, enough is enough. Nell herself said the book is like Unbroken, but funnier and with slightly less torture. <laughs> um, Nell will be in conversation with Alexandra uh, Petri, a Washington Post columnist who writes the Compost blog, uh, which is a mix of opinion and humor. Uh, she's the author as well of a book of essays, A Field Guide to Awkward Science, uh, Silences, uh, which was published three years ago. And she's done a bit of stand-up comedy herself, appeared on Jeopardy, and uh, among other claims to fame, although I didn't really check with her uh, this, uh, about this, I think she's performed in an international whistling competition. Anyway, please join me in welcoming Nell Scovell and Alexandra Petri. a long list of credits because I can't keep a job. <laughs> Ooh, wireless mic is on. Oh man, I just have to say, if they knew how excited I was to do this, they would have put up a perimeter around this event instead of letting me like just sit here and talk to you for an hour because I'm very excited. As the intro said, if you like things that are good, you should like Nell Scavell because she has made all the things that are good. Um, she's really had a hand in everything from uh, The Simpsons with the Blowfish episode, uh, to Late Night with David Letterman to lean in uh, a phrase without which brunch would be impossible. Um, and I know someone once said to me, what did we say before lean in? And it's people, it, you can hear right. Um, it's just women uh, didn't have permission to be ambitious. So yeah. that's what it is. Yeah. So I thought, uh, it, it was funny because in the beginning of the book you're talking about how like, unlike most comedy writers, you came from a family that was, like, chill and supportive and uh, yeah. liked that you made jokes. And you were actually asked to contribute to a book of, like, narcissistic moms, a memoir. And you're like, I can't do it. Yeah, I had the, such a nice mom. And um, one of my favorite stories is she went to uh, my second grade parent-teacher meeting. And at that meeting, the teacher said to my mom... Um, Nell makes too many jokes in class, please tell her to stop. So my mom uh, delivered the message on my 40th birthday. <laughs> and 
by then I'd been an established comedy writer and, and it was only then that she told me my third grade teacher had notes on my personality. <laughs> <laughs> now that's how you give a note. That's, that's some terrific momming. And you also had a funny aunt, uh, you, which you described when your, one of your family members was reading Little Women and she went over and said... Oh, so my, my sister Alice was uh, on the sofa reading Little Women and my aunt Pinky um, tapped her on the shoulder and said, don't get too attached to Beth. <laughs> Spoiler alert. And I was so lucky. I had two aunts, and, and they were really funny, and they got positive attention for it. And they weren't self-deprecating, like Phyllis Diller or even Joan Rivers. They were, they were dark, and my, my Aunt Jane worked blue. She loved telling <laughs> dirty jokes. And it was um, such a surprise to me when I went into the real world, and there was this belief. You know, Gary Shandling told me, you write like a guy. And I thought, no, women are funny. <laughs> yeah, no. It's funny because that was both, a, I guess at the time, a great compliment back in the wilds of the past, but also a terrible compliment. That's not a right. compliment. Well, the other thing is, you know, Gary, so much of his humor came from his insecurity about his looks and his relationships. And the truth is, he wrote like a girl. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this, we're being stereotypical. <laughs> yeah. No, well, I, at the risk of sort of segueing from that into politics, I feel like Donald Trump also sort of has the, like the insecurity thing where it's like, am I beautiful enough? And like, does, does my hair look nice? And all the things that people are like, women, be insecure about those specific things. Right. Um, but, you know, and you, you also say that uh, Letterman managed, the secret of his continued uh, drive was that he maintained the insecurity of a much less successful person, even at levels of wild success. Yeah, when I, when I was working on the show, I remember when Friday we had taped a fine hour of TV, and he came storming through the office shouting, I'm going to go to my house in Connecticut, shut all the doors and windows, and pump the house full of snot. <laughs> and he, Which is an oddly specific thing to want to yeah. do. Yeah, uh, and uh, you know, there's another story about how he was so angry after a show that he lined up producers and told them each to take a swing at him, and <laughs> and nobody wants to hit their boss, and he would he would get mad at them and say harder, no harder, and I realize he's it's such an interesting spin. He's the bully who makes you hit him. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I read that fan fiction on the internet somewhere where it's like, hit, hit David Letterman harder, but I, don't, I didn't know that it was real until I read your book, which yeah. so many aspects of, of the, the things that you witnessed. So I think you say that you showed up at this job and you were dressed in a certain way because they say dress for the job you want. Right, and I, I wanted a job that was usually held by men, so I, I dressed like a little boy most of the time. <laughs> Um, and I, I really wanted, um, I didn't want attention. I thought, if they don't notice me in the room, they'll just let me stay here. Yeah. Uh, and I would pitch really quickly, you get in, get out. <laughs> just like read it off the thing and, and go away. No, because I feel something similar as, like I didn't think of myself as a feminist growing up because I was just like, they fixed that in the 70s probably. Right. Like feminism was over and women can just be people. And then if every time that I had to walk into a room and not just be a person, but have to be like the woman, yeah. I was like, oh no, we do have to fix all kinds of things. And I, I felt like reading through the book, you had a sort of similar experience often. Well, on my very first job, which was a show called The Wilton North Report, um, and if anyone here remembers it, they're lying. <laughs> because, <laughs> because I called Fox to ask them for permission to use photos from the show, and the studio, uh, the network claimed it never existed. <laughs> they, they erased it from their database. It's deep in a warehouse right. somewhere. There's no corporate memory of that. So, uh, and the show was canceled after just a month, and, and the most notable part of working on the show was the writing team in the office next to mine was Conan O'Brien and Greg Daniels. And Greg went on to create Parks and Rec, and King of the Hill and The Office, and I'm not sure what happened to Conan, but he was very funny. <laughs> Seems like a nice man, yeah. So as the show gets canceled, we're all sitting around thinking our, our career's over, and one of the other writers, a, a guy who was probably my age, named Phil, said, well, now you're lucky. And I said, why am I lucky? And he said, well, every show is looking for a woman. 
And I said, a woman and nine men. How does that make me lucky? <laughs> yeah, in, in, I think in Bossy Pants, Tina Fey said, like, she had for years the thought that you had to compete with the other woman in the room. And it's like, no, yeah. you're competing with all of the people in the room. Right. And well, their notion that it's just one lady slot, like the Highlander, as you say in... Uh, there can be only one. Yeah. Uh, well, I quote you in the book <laughs> with this amazing tweet, and it's, this is what gives me hope, is that uh, I was naive up until about 10 years ago, but it seems like women get it much sooner now. And do you remember your tweet? Oh, yeah, no, I, I, I said, I wish I could go back and tell past me, shake past me, in fact, I was very adamant, and tell her that if you're the only girl in the room, it doesn't mean that you're better, it means that there's something wrong with the room. Yeah. <laughs> And which I have to say, if you ever write a book, telling someone that you've quoted them in the book is a great way to get them to go through the book really quickly. <laughs> um, so it was, it was like the perfect carrot, and I was like, oh, but then I, then I couldn't put it but down after I'd gotten to my quote because it's it's so good. You gotta buy this book and then give it to your friends and then buy it again. Uh, just keep buying it. Uh, send send the economy to work. Uh, but. You've worked in a variety of different writers' rooms, and you, yeah. I think, when you were thinking about writing your piece that you did for the New York Times, uh, not to pivot to your like 2009 moment, oh, Vanity Fair, yeah, Vanity Fair, yeah, about uh, Letterman, you were like, first you're like Nicholas Kristof, you should be the one to write this, <laughs> tell this story for me, and he's like, no, you should tell it, and then you talk to Albert Brooks, and he's like, you have to say this because in his experience, when you had a better sampling of humanity, you got better comedy. It does I, produce comedy. And it, what's interesting is uh, Albert often wrote with this woman named Monica Johnson. And I think it's one of the reasons, like Lost in America, the Julie Haggerty character is so well drawn is there's a, uh, there's a lot of Monica in that character. Yeah, no, because otherwise you just have these sort of faceless monoliths who you get at the end of like a door prize. It's like, oh, you got a girl, hooray. Yeah. Instead of sort of seeing the inside. So... I guess, do you want to, part of what was fascinating to me throughout this was not just seeing the things that did get to happen that we got to see on television, but all the things that you write and then they disappear forever into a deep void. Um, like the Kennedy Center Honors, uh, as a DC denizen, I'm like super obsessed with those and every year my family watches them and we like, you know, you see like Victor Borga is getting a tribute and it's like a seven-year-old playing violin <laughs> and it's very exciting and it's like, Victor Borga, is this what you wanted? And he's like, maybe. Um, but you got to write the Lily Tomlin tribute. Right. And, so, yes. Well, I worked on the 2014 and for, I wouldn't mention this in most places, but it was the last year that the Stevens, George Stevens and his son were producing the show. So um, the, there was a lot of high emotion and Lily Tomlin was being honored, and I think they hired me in part because no one was quite sure what she did to deserve this <laughs> honor. And I kind of came in and said, well, she invented this new art form, um, which is that multiple character uh, show. And, um, well, it's very frustrating. And you were like, get Kate McKinnon on there. Like, yeah, that I was, was. and they were like, who? And, um, <laughs> And they said, well, see if Kate McKinnon likes Lily Tomlin. And I was like, I'm pretty sure she does, um, which turns out to be true. Uh, but what's, what's sad about that story is Tom Hanks also was being um, lauded that night. And Tom Hanks had um, Steven Spielberg comes out and speaks about him. Then Marty Short comes out and speaks about him. Then three leading ladies of Broadway come out and sing to Tom Hanks. And then Marty Short comes out and sings Yankee Doodle Dandy with um, really clever new lyrics written by Amanda Green oh, yeah. with not one, not two, but three marching bands. <laughs> Lily, they, they had four women who came on stage and, and spoke about her. And I came in and I said, well, what about singing 9 to 5? Because one of the women was Reba McIntyre. And they were like, mm, no, we don't think that's necessary. And if you watch the show, they, they cut, even from this, the much shorter tribute to Lily, it's cut down so there really are no jokes. Like Kate <laughs> Kinnon opened on this huge rocker, like Edith Ann, and she had this funny line, which is, 
you know, it's like getting off the lap of the Lincoln Memorial. <laughs> and did this very funny bit of physical comedy, which you would only see if you had been there at the Kennedy Center. And I think it times out that Tom Hanks got 13 minutes and Lily Tomlin gets six. So you can win the highest award in the art for the arts in this country and still get short shrift if you're a woman. Yeah, no, that's even less than the usual percentage that a woman gets of a man's thing. I mean, like look, I love teens. Tom Hanks as much as every man, woman in volleyball, but <laughs> <laughs> that just didn't seem fair. No, and you have a lot of experience writing for different people's voices uh, as from David Letterman to uh, the president of the United States, and not, yeah. not the current one, the, the previous one. <laughs> the uh, good one. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, I mean, no judgment, but definitely some judgment. 100% uh, uh, judgment. And how, how did that vary? How did you... Well, Obama was a great joke teller. And in fact, I quote Albert Brooks saying he has Johnny Carson's timing. And it was... Um, I... I I ended up writing for him because he, I'm trying to remember, like in 2011, he visited Facebook. The president visits Facebook, and I'm writing for both Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg, and they asked me to provide some jokes. And one of them was, um, Mark was going to say, you know, the president's very uh, popular on Facebook. With um, half a million more followers, he'd be tied to SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> And I remember getting a call from the communications guy at Facebook saying, we're, we're trying to um, honor the president, not roast him. <laughs> but my friend Sheryl Sandberg thought it was funny and gave it to John Favreau, the speechwriter. And he wrote me and he said, uh, can we use this? And it, it is a better joke if it comes out of the president's mouth and it's very <laughs> self-deprecating. He's always dreamed to reach SpongeBob SquarePants levels of popularity. And but. I did, like, the two days, I said, um, he said, can we use the joke? And I said, well, I'd, I'd be honored to serve my country. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then two days later, I'm, um, like, reading the newspaper, and they had the joke there as a quip, he said, at a fundraiser in San Francisco. And I thought, well, that's the difference, which is usually when you write it for a joke, it doesn't end up, yeah. you know, in the, in the news section of the paper. Yeah, no. When, when after the president made a joke, it used to be like, oh, this is exciting. And you had a joke for him that didn't get used uh, about Matt Damon. Uh, like no, a, it did get oh, used did. Oh, in good. the end. Oh, good. Because it was very insulting and correct. Uh, <laughs> and it was about the Adjustment Bureau, uh, which is a film that Matt Damon appeared in. So at one point, Matt Damon was quoted saying he was disappointed in the president's performance. And so one of the jokes I wrote was... Um, uh, the president says, you know, I, I love Matt Damon, but rec and recently he said he was disappointed in my performance. Well, I saw the Adjustment Bureau and right back at you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so this went into the script, and then the Saturday morning, I get an email from um, Favs saying, the president isn't sure he can do this joke. He thinks it's too mean. <laughs> uh, so I wrote back saying, I've seen the Adjustment Bureau, and truth is a defense. <laughs> yeah, it's not liable if it's true. I think that's the rule. Now, the, the one he didn't do was, um, they um, tightened up. Uh, I wrote a joke, which is uh, him saying, um, people say I'm too chummy with Hollywood. I was just laughing about that with Clooney the other day. <laughs> Oh, man, what times? Those were times in the past. Those were, were times. Uh, and and then, okay, I'll tell another yeah, one no, I like, which going. is um, <laughs> he, he had just turned 50, and uh, the joke was, he did not do this, um, I just turned 50, so I had my first colonoscopy, um, and you know what the doctors found? Mitch McConnell. <laughs> <laughs> that guy can obstruct anything. <laughs> Why would they not let Why you would say, they not do that? <laughs> Mitch McConnell's known for his vivid sense of humor and love of being compared to a colon obstruction. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what what is up there? I don't know. I guess that the light awaits me in the future. And I and I wrote some jokes for Hillary, um, which she get delivered at the Al Smith dinner, um, and did a really great job. That was one right before the election. And that was um, one where President Trump was like, I hate Catholics. Uh, yeah, no, she hates Catholics. That was just a <laughs> awful moment but um so the i wrote the transition joke which is because they always start off serious and then they get into their jokes which was um 
uh, this is such a special event. I took a break from my rigorous nap schedule to be here. <laughs> and uh, she was she was terrific that night. Yeah, no, because I feel like you say when you're about writing jokes that there's sort of the response you're hoping to get, and I, I bookmarked this because I was so excited by your description of it, is that it's laughter is a sign of impact, and nothing's more satisfying than having a positive impact on people's lives, which I think really speaks to sort of the question of unified humor theory when it comes to what jokes work, and like if the president's right. making jokes now, why they might or might not be working. <laughs> I love how like, non-judgmental I'm no, I do. Being. No, you know, some people say that um, the current president uh, does not have a sense of humor, and I, I disagree with that. I think he does have a sense of humor. I think it's very mean. You know, he posted that video of him hitting a golf ball, and it knocks Hillary in the head. You know, he spliced it together with her falling, uh, and that's considered um, funny. Yeah, in some cultures. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's, it's short and fraud with a laugh track. Um, yeah. And it is, you know, they always, the right has tried time and again to do sort of the left version of a comedy show like The Daily Show or Colbert, and it never works. And I think it's because they're trying to do a similar kind of snarky, smart humor. And I actually think if if they just did a show like Ann Coulter that was mean, yeah. that it, w it would work. Yeah, where instead of like Greg Gutfeld being like, kids are strange, it was just like Ann Coulter being like, listen, the wall is necessary. But, yeah. but well, no, I think it's more yeah. like if they, uh, they sat around trying to come up with new nicknames for Steve Bannon, and it was like, you know, gonorrhea nose. Or, yeah, just <laughs> just a full two hours of that. I would yeah. honestly watch a full two hours of people nicknaming Steve Bannon. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't. I would delete it from my browser history, but I would definitely. And a sloppy watch it. Steve was disappointing. I yeah. want it better. No, especially given the build up to that. But you were also. I think one of the moments that really struck me in the book is when you first walked into the offices at Letterman, and like the, one of the first jokes somebody made to you was they're like, "Ah, oh, I bet by the time like I'm gonna see a tampon fall out of your purse." which was kind of a joke like substance, but was really just him saying like a negative thing to you and pointing out that you were female. Yeah, it t it, and it only took me 20 years to figure it out. I, <laughs> I, he said, um, yeah, before this is over, I will see a tampon fall out of your purse. And it, it kind of shook me, and it was such a strange thing to say. And I would tell people the story, and they, the response was always, why would somebody say it? And then decades later, I'm working on Lean In, and I read about stereotype threat, which is when a, a group is reminded, well, I'll just tell you the example. So if you give a girl a math test, and on the first page it makes you check off what your gender is, she will do worse on that math test, because we know girls are bad at math, and she's just self-identified as a girl, and it will create anxiety. Is, is the reason why. So I, I look back and I'm pretty sure he was just reminding yeah. me that I was different from the rest. That's, yeah. No, cause, cause, and so it's all subconscious. I don't think he, he meant yeah, to he do it. Yeah, he wasn't like, oh, I've, I've, re I've gone into the future and read Lean In and I know exactly <laughs> how to get at her. Um, and it will be do by doing this. No, but I do think like you, could, you use jokes to sort of impose your vision of the world on people in, in some way by getting them to laugh or not laugh. And... Uh, so in that case, he was sort of like signaling you out and being like, here's the woman and we're going to make a joke to her. But yeah, that was, so Letterman was my dream job. Um, and I, I was able to get it. And then it turned out not to be so dreamy. Um, and, and I left after uh, five months, I think. But you sort of describe yourself as being a good culture fit, quote unquote, because you're into like sci-fi things. Yeah, and, and sports, and and I'd gone to Harvard, which a lot of the other writers had been to. So I think they were they felt like we can kind of sort of trust her. <laughs> yeah, wood paneled rooms and a sense of who plays what baseball part. Um, and so, in fact, you wrote a like you're like a Star Trek fan, right? Huge, like, yeah. Because I'm also really into it. And you wrote like the, the Space Ghost Coast to Coast like based on... Oh, that's right. Amok, Amok Time. time. Yeah. yeah. I never know how to pronounce that out loud. I it's think it's Amok, that. Okay. Yeah. Amok Time. The one where like Spock has to go home to mate and like he's... Ponfar overcomes him 
and but it's the space ghost guy. And, right. And you said that was the most pleasant experience you ever had in terms of getting a script to production quickly. Right. So that's um, for those who didn't watch Space Ghost Coast to Coast. That they yeah, watch it. It is pretty great. And they gave this cartoon figure uh, his own talk show, and they would tape real people and cut them in and just chop up whatever they said and, and make jokes out of it. But his band leader was a praying mantis. Um, and so, of course, praying mantises, when they mate, the female eats the head off the, the male. So we thought it would be funny if um, this praying mantis had to go back to his home planet and mate, and someone tells him about what happens afterwards, and he... Uh, is horrified. And I say we, I wrote it with Joel Hodgson, who created Mystery Science Theater um, 2000. Uh, for those, he's the guy in the red jumpsuit. Uh, see, literally everything that is good has been touched by now. <laughs> um, and so, I, like, your friendship comes up a lot in this book because you meet, meet people and then they sort of recur periodically, yeah. sort of showing up. How do you maintain friendships over time and through Hollywood? So one of the um, interesting shifts when I was writing this is when um, I started, when I got the deal, I thought, this is great. I'll be able to settle some scores. <laughs> and you start writing, and you actually realize, oh, it's so much more fun to thank the people who were kind to you and helpful to you than it is to get back. And then you go, in fact, the meanest thing I could do is <laughs> ignore them. And I actually made a t-shirt that said, I'm writing a memoir and you're not in it. <laughs> but I've, I've never had the guts to actually wear it. So <laughs> yeah, the only thing worse than being mentioned in a memoir That's right, is not, not being mentioned in a memoir. Uh, so it, it, it really, it was such a joy to thank. I, I had amazing male mentors. I had some female mentors, but because there were a lot more men in leadership positions. The majority were men. And, um, oh, we have this in common. Oh, yeah, we, we both like attract. We love elder old men. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> They're terrific. They're the best. So I had two. One was a guy named Irving Brecker, who wrote two Marx Brothers movies. He wrote Go West and At the Circus. And I met Irv. Um, at the uh, young age of 92, I, I went Spring to. Chicken. Yeah, I went to see him. They were screening at the circus at my local um, Santa Monica movie theater. And we watched the movie, and then they bring Irv on stage. And um, he opens with this line. He's, he, he had lost his eyes, most of his eyesight by then. But he, he starts with, my wife tells me that on the marquee it says, Irving Brecker Live. That'll be a surprise to my doctors. <laughs> So I just fell in love. Yeah, you're and like, I must meet this man. Let's become cousin buddies. I did, buddies. and I, I was like, yeah, we're not going to um, like uh, let the friendship unfold. There wasn't time for that. So it was just like, we're going to be best friends, and I'm going to come visit you every Sunday. Yes. Uh, which I, like which Sundays I did. Like Sundays with Maury, but on I but guess with, Tuesdays with Maury, but on Sundays. But, and with dirty jokes. <laughs> yes. He was a great joke teller, and uh, he was a great friend. And then the other, um, you know, he's <laughs> I'm. There's so many great Irv quotes where um, at one point I, I, I said to him, Irv, I've never asked you, you know, um, uh, are you, what do you think of gay marriage? And he, he said, I'm, I'm fine with gay marriage. I just haven't found the right guy. <laughs> 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 and then the other man was, Irv, uh, was Arthur Penn, who directed Bonnie and Clyde and Little Big Man and, and was a real visionary. And I met him, I was writing an article for Rolling Stone about a movie he directed, and I spoke to him in 1985, and we basically kept the interview going until we couldn't anymore. And he, um, I get it, when I got a directing job, my first email was to him, and you know, it's crazy. Which, he, yeah, he, but if, if he's willing to help. Right, I mean, it was like asking Michael Phelps to teach your five-year-old how to swim. <laughs> um, but like, you might as well. He knows how to swim. Yeah, but I, so I was up on this set in Canada, and I would be furiously emailing him about what do I do in this situation, and he was wonderful. 
Yeah, no, it, it really is a wonderful email. And that's why you got to get the book just to see the emails. Because yeah, you it's beautiful. all these beautiful receipts of people being nice and also people being mean. And <laughs> which is, I guess, what a book is for. No. No, you know, someone asked me, like, um, because I did keep a lot, and I think it's because I was a journalist first, so I, I like primary sources. Oh, yes. Um, but then someone said, well, did you always think you'd write a book? And I, would say, and I said, well, that would show a lot of confidence. And the truth is it was the opposite. I was convinced TV would go away mm -hmm. at any moment, and I wanted proof that I'd worked on these shows. So I kept all my Letterman scripts, and I even kept like the, the notes on my first drafts of my new heart episodes. Yeah, no, you got to store it just in case the next generation yeah. asks. And another thing, speaking of your time directing, because I think that this was a fascinating to read, but your aunt sort of dirty jokes, dirty jokes are a theme of like how you would get rooms to feel comfortable. And at the risk of asking you to share a dirty joke with the room, I feel like this has definitely been a theme. And do you know any good icebreakery ones? <laughs> I don't know, Brad? Your hour. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there, there is a joke I, I used to tell um, on the first day of set, whether I was producing or directing, which is um, a man's waiting for the elevator, and the door's open, and there's a beautiful woman inside. So he goes in, the door's closed, and he says to her, can I smell your pussy? And she says, absolutely not. And he says, then it must be your feet. <laughs> And there are a few things I love about this joke. One is it's gra grammatically correct. That's he doesn't true. say may, yeah, I, no, which would not right. lend not itself. for permission. That's He's right. For information. And uh, the, the second is it's a stinky feet joke. Yeah. <laughs> Even babies love stinky feet jokes. Yeah. So it's really quite harmless. <laughs> no, yeah, it turns around. It's like my favorite pole joke. No, this is, I'm kidding. Uh, no, don't. But it. It's like, why did they have to tear down the stadium in Warsaw? Because no matter where you sat, you were behind a pool. Oh it goes God. from like a joke about a group of people to a joke about view obstruction, which I just think is beautiful. Um, yeah, no. And so I... But I, I... Going back to the jokes having that impact and that laugh is I still, um, you know, even you know, lean in and they just had its fifth anniversary and, you know, it's Cheryl's book and I helped her but um, I still kind of love a laugh better, like a really great joke. And I wrote a few for tonight, which I thought I'd, yeah. I'd try out. Unleash, um, unleash. Because I still um, love writing jokes more than anything else. Hold on. So this is for tonight, I wrote. Um, Topical. Oh. You want me to hold? I can hold something. Okay. Uh, Mike Pence has a rule that he won't be alone with a woman unless his spouse is there. Melania has a similar rule. She won't be alone with her spouse unless the photographer's there. Uh, anyone else think it's strange that a guy who loves unprotected sex is so obsessed with building a wall? Protect your own borders. <laughs> I'll do just a couple more. Uh, after hearing the news about Don Jr., Hillary said she could put half of Trump's son in a basket of divorceables. I don't know. That's kind of a pun. Yeah, I like oh, it. Yeah. Um, I remember when President Obama held a press conference and called upon only female reporters and answered their questions thoughtfully? None of those things could happen today. <laughs> yeah. Funny because it's true. No, well, I feel like the two big events in the book world this week were Mike Pence's Rabbit wrote a book, but also That's you wrote a book, which is great. And furthermore, Jill Twist for the uh, oh, this is cool. Last yeah. week tonight, I uh, wrote a book from the Rabbit's true perspective, sharing his real truth, um, which sold out. And I feel like one of the cool things about you is you've been like the the human ladder through which people have climbed up uh, into because you know folks and you put them up. So Jill Twist was someone. Um, I'm, excuse me, I met on Twitter, and she wrote the funniest things like, um, I feel sorry for gluten-free pigeons. Um, or, <laughs> or the other one I love with, bananas are so clicky. <laughs> um, and I just thought she had this really fresh voice. So I wrote to her and said, um, 
what do you do? And she was an SAT tutor. Oh, man. And I said, have you ever thought of writing for TV? Um, and she said, oh, I'd love that. And my friend Tim Carvel, who um, I used to go visit at The Daily Show, and at the office mate, at the time, you had this weird office mate, and I'd come in, and the office mate would nod, and then sit with his back to us, like there was an invisible wall, and we'd have to visit. So that was John Oliver. <laughs> Behind the invisible wall. <laughs> That's right. And Tim went off with John to create last week, tonight, and asked me, do you have any ideas, you know, recommendations for writers? So I said, well, there's this woman, Jill Twiss. So she submits to the show and out of hundreds of applications gets hired and you know John Oliver recently said to me like she should have been writing TV her entire life like he <laughs> said I've never met anyone who's so perfect for it and so she wrote their bunny book and um, yeah she also helped edit my book hey she's all over the place so you said that one of the first things that somebody said to you back when you were a journalist was somebody said don't take this the wrong way but you should write for TV <laughs> and I feel like you provided that same sort of tap on the shoulder to other people. You like slide into their DMs and open a world of possibilities. I think I did that to you and you're like, <laughs> I have a good job now. <laughs> I have exactly the job I want. <laughs> I'm like, I'm flattered, but man, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, tell me more about this. Well, I do think, you know, and, and one of the reasons um, I advocate is I, it's really not enough to just encourage people. Um, and I, I say this to m men too, which is, you know, it's great to encourage someone, but it's better to advocate for them um, bec or hire them, which is the best. Because there's a, uh, there's just not enough. Yeah, and then, if you're just like, go forth and like write a book as opposed to like, here I am, here's a door, here's the other door. Because like just knowing where the door is, I think is the biggest thing that stands in a lot of folks' way. If you're just like standing on the sidewalk. Like I thought that all the, when people talk about elevator pitches in Hollywood, I just assumed there was an elevator somewhere <laughs> that you would go if you wanted to make a movie and just stand in it and say like a minute's worth of things and there was like a big line of writers outside of it and they'd all go in and they'd say their minute of things. I've been told that's not how it actually works. Um, but having someone who does know and opens No, and the other, the other thing you learn in Hollywood is don't get in an elevator with Bill Cosby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, you, you said recently that part of the sad thing about all the Harvey Weinstein and Bill Cosby news, part of the sad thing, because the entire thing is a nightmare, yes. is just the bar has been so lowered. It, it has. And, and in fact, two of the producers who came out and condemned Harvey Weinstein, I, I know have both settled sexual harassment suits. Um, so I think there is this using the far worse offenses to cover the more mundane offenses. Yeah. Because you were like, well, if it's not, if you don't molest 24 women, you're a gentleman. Suddenly, you're a gentleman. Think, <laughs> is how you put it. And now, what I think, one of the moments in your book when I sort of gasped, and it turned out to be fine, uh, was you moved to Hollywood and you immediately, your boss is like, you can live in my house and we'll commute to work together. And you were <laughs> oh, like, it wasn't just sure. my boss, it was Tommy Smothers for of anyone of, of a certain generation. Um, and that worked out fine. That did. And oh, it was so cool because he, CBS was renting him this huge apartment. I stayed in the maid's room. Um, and it was at, in the same building just down the street from the Chateau Marmont that Betty Davis lived. Ooh. So one of my first weeks in Hollywood, I actually bumped into Betty Davis. Wow. Uh, yeah. What, I love that connection like? to the... Uh, she, she was impatiently waiting for the elevator. <laughs> <laughs> you could have pitched, yeah. Um, I mean, like, here's my six yeah, seconds that's worth of <laughs> Betty Davis movie act action. But also, everything in the, in the back of the book was fascinating because it was like, here's the millions of things that you wrote that never wound up seeing the light of day, but I want to see the light of day of all of them. Like, you're all about Eve, where it's like... Oh, yeah, that was a good one. It's a good concept. Yeah, everyone, if you know people who make things, tell them to make <laughs> your all about Eve. Well, things. the other one is, I, I once did wrote a reboot of McCloud for Brett Butler wow. for USA, and that one I was sad didn't go forward because... I thought that would have worked. Yeah. No, but I think we're sort of living in a... Everything's getting rebooted now, like of the things that you worked on. Yeah, three different things, Charm, Sabrina, and Murphy Brown. Oh, I saw a great joke the other day, I didn't write this, that Trump has had more secretaries than Murphy Brown. <laughs> <laughs> uh, man, no. I, no, it is a golden age of no new ideas. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a good way of putting it. <laughs> 
because, like, looking around at... So the, the Simpsons episode was really fun to watch you go through the process of how do you make this and how do you, like, break the story down and how do you send it in. So you come up with the idea for what if Homer eats some poison blowfish and learns he's going to die, but then you have to go into the room and, like, say it to people. Uh, yeah, no, that was nerve-wracking. And the reason I, I actually have my exact pitch is that I wrote it down on, on a notebook so I could look at that instead of having to make eye contact with anyone in the room. It was very intimidating, but it was also very early in the show. So I rem it was the second season, and I remember someone brought up Ned Flanders, and I said, Who, wh what's his character? Because it was so early, we didn't know about the neighbor, and someone said, well, he's unfailingly nice to Homer, which of course makes Homer angry. <laughs> Yeah, that, that is true, but it, it turned out there was much more also to him. But, and so you had, at the end of the episode, instead of the advice that he winds up giving uh, his kids about, you know, it was that way when I got here, and uh, cover for me, and I, I, I've just totally messed up the punchline. I feel like... No, well, that room was so funny, and that people would pitch so many jokes. We could have written three scripts uh, for that episode, and I do use this example of you know, the, this joke I wrote and what it was replaced with. And it's sort of fun for readers to say, like, which one is, you know, how do you compare two jokes? Yeah, no, you go spelunking back into the past and you figure out, oh, this one could have been there. And that could have yeah. been the ending of the episode. Instead of him eating pork rinds, it could have been all of the things that he promised people coming back to haunt him. Right. And then there's the, the super mean joke that was pitched in the writer's room and then never made it into the script, which is um, Homer thinks he's going to die, so he goes back to, to say goodbye to his father, <laughs> Grandpa Simpson, who says, you know, they say the worst thing that can happen to a person is losing a child, but it's really not so bad. <laughs> <laughs> that is dark. <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, you can, you can just hear it. Grandpa yeah, you can, it. yeah. <laughs> it's not so bad. <laughs> but actually, the, the most fun room I've been in was, um, well, Sabrina, because I agreed with the boss. But, um, <laughs> but after that was Murphy Brown. And, and that was, uh, I was there the year after Avery was born. Um, and it was post-Dan Quayle. And I remember Candace Bergen saying, you know, you you want to be on the front page of the art section, not the news, uh. <laughs> when you're an actress. Uh, and that was um, just a wonderful group of writers and a wonderful cast. Uh, so that was the nicest. That sound, it sounded very nice. And you said one of the nice things about walking in was that you looked around and you weren't the only woman. So you oh, that's just, right. had to just be yourself instead of having to be a representative for half of the world. Uh, yeah, there were four women and six men, and the women weren't all lowly. We were we were uh, mid to upper. And then, you know, years later, just within the past five years, I was once again the only female um, on staff. And we were writing an episode. This was on a show called Warehouse 13, which is actually kind of wonderful. It was on the Sci-Fi Network. And I made one of the characters pregnant for the episode, and gave her this heightened sense of smell, which happens to pregnant women. And I, I'm on a phone call with the network getting notes, and someone says, so this smell thing, is, is that real? And I, and I say, yes, it's a thing. And they argue with me that they've never heard of it. And I realized seven people are on this phone call, and I'm the only one who's ever been pregnant. <laughs> and they're all arguing with me. <laughs> <laughs> you could have said anything at that point. You could have been like, also, you fly. Yeah. <laughs> they wouldn't have known. <laughs> oh, man. So uh, I think... Oh, that went fast. It's yeah, time for I questions. Have, I have so many more questions, but let's have the audience say questions because... And microphones. there are microphones, so go to them if you could be so kind. Or we could maybe pass them, but I think go to them would be ideal. Hi, Nell. It's Nina. Hi, Nina. Um, I wanted to pick up on that sense of smell one, because that was actually the question I had uh, throughout the book. Is it a real thing? Yes, it no, is. Yeah, no. But uh, just actually, that this opens up a whole issue of what, what we're missing out 
by having so few women writers? Because there's just a whole other viewpoint there, and I was wondering whether you could actually point to some characters or in some, in, in some of the shows where there haven't been very many women writers that could have been um, you know, more, more real or they could have benefited from more women writers because you make that interesting business point that you have to have more women to right. actually reach out to more, a bigger audience. But what is it that we are missing out would be interesting to hear from you. There's, I don't think there's a difference between the way men write and women write. Um, you know, that's the craft, and if you're writing for David Letterman, you have to um, capture David Letterman's voice. Uh, and that was easy for me, because there's basically a tall, cranky man inside <laughs> me. But, Former weatherman. Um, I mean, not inside me, but that's another story. <laughs> but um, there's... <laughs> just realized, oh, bad no. choice. Uh, but what's different is experiences, and, and also... Um, references. So I do write in this book that, you know, when I was writing for Obama, I wrote a joke about um, now that there were three women on the Supreme Court, for the first time they could play double Dutch. And, and I maintain that's a joke that probably only, well, the guys were playing kickball and the girls were double Dutching with my friend Sarah Longson, who um, went to elementary school with me. Like, we know those references. Uh, I wrote a joke for Obama that he did do about the Easter egg hunt, where um, it was about we had a great Easter egg hunt. Um, I would hand the kids bags of candies, and Michelle would snatch them out of their hands. <laughs> <laughs> snatch them. <laughs> yeah, and um, I don't know that anyone ever made fun of Michelle before, because I think they, the men were actually um, too respectful. So that's another thing you get, like women can make fun of women, that, like Seth Meyers now has that segment, jokes um, that Seth can't do. <laughs> and, and so, Anu, does that answer? Okay. Hey there, it's Judy. Hi. Um, I'm at the point in my career, I liked what you said about uh, advocating for women. I'm at the point in my career as I'm pushing 50 where a lot of women call me to mentor them. And I take a decidedly tough love approach. Like, Stop apologizing. Stop saying this might be a stupid question, but stop, you know, phrasing your statements as if they're questions. How, how do you please mentor? Please now say, this might be a stupid question, but. but. <laughs> <laughs> please. Exactly. You know, how do you mentor younger women? And, and you know, what, do you, what is your approach and what advice do you have for those of us who are doing it and trying to bring along the next generation to really bust down the doors? Well, I'd love to see more men mentoring because I remember when... Um, <laughs> um, I know me doing snaps because I yeah. agreed. Ka when Catherine Bigelow won the first a Academy Award for Best Director for Women um, as a woman, I remember I was um, in a women in film group and everyone said, well, she has to mentor more women. And I said, no, she has to make more good movies. And there are so many... Um, old men who might be retired who could actually help younger women um, and, and they have more time for that. I think it's sometimes just another unfair burden placed on women yeah. that on top of everything else. Also fix sexism. It's like, no, men need to fix sexism. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's a two-person job. So, uh, yeah. It's, I, I try to mentor by getting people jobs because I think hiring women is what will change things, not um, reading scripts or, uh, I, I can't even get my agent to read my script. So when, <laughs> don't send me a script, I cannot help you. This guy's next. Oh, <laughs> hello. hello. Um, as you look back on your career, if there was one thing you could change, what would it be? Um, I, well, uh, regrets, I've had a few. It was I, the, the <laughs> great song title. <laughs> I went to a, a, a Vanity Fair Oscar party. I would go every year because I worked, I uh, used to babysit for Graydon Carter's kids, and he always included me. Um, and one year I went into the ladies' room, and they had like tubes of Estee Lauder moisturizer. And I thought, oh, this is, this is great, just when I need to get a little dewy look. So I squirted some out, and 
rubbed it on my face and realized it was lip balm. <laughs> <laughs> like really greasy lip balm. So that's one of my biggest regrets. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have two nieces who are still angry about the election, and I send them Alexandra's columns because I regard her as kind of the Counselor Troy or Tinkerbell of the resistance. <laughs> um, oh, they, I need more cleavage if I'm going to be Counselor Troy. Well, <laughs> you look great. Uh, no, sorry. Derailing what, the question. My, my sister tries to explain social work and social policy to them. Their dad tries to explain unions to them. How can we make them less angry? Well, by, I, I guess we can book. both take this. Yeah, I, I think, well, read this book. It's very okay, soothing. Right. Um, <laughs> but also, I don't think being angry is necessarily a bad thing because women often get told, don't be angry. You won't I be agree. funny if you're angry. And it's like, no, just use that anger to power something. So if you're angry, go out and make something. And like... Anger into action. Exactly. Yeah. Magneto that heck out of it. That's a, not a verb. <laughs> <laughs> it does remind me that um, right after the election... Friends would call and be like, Nell, cheer me up. And five minutes later, they'd be like, I have to go. You're just making me feel worse. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't answer that. I'm still angry myself. Yeah. I'm from Newton, Massachusetts, which is, you know, the most liberal city in the most liberal state. So yeah. this is a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny because I all. I remember before the election, I thought, oh, it would be funny to, like, see what it would be like if this world happened, if, like, if Trump yeah. got elected, I'd love to watch that in a snow globe. And instead it's like, no, I'm in the snow globe and all of my stuff is in the snow globe and that's not ideal in any way. Well, I, I also, one of my first jobs was at Spy Magazine. I don't know if anyone remembers that. Yeah. But that's where short-fingered Vulgarian came from. <laughs> and, and so I've been making fun of this guy since the mid-80s. Yeah. You well, know, I mean, I didn't write that joke, but I was part of all the packages that made fun of him. And uh, it's... I was just with my old boss, Kurt Anderson, who does Studio 360, and we, we still wake up every morning saying, is this a dream? <laughs> yeah, yeah when am I going to wake up, wake up? Yeah. <laughs> but you also, I think, with that same publication, did a profile of, like, William F. Buckley's dog, which, not that I'm, like, really into, like, William F. Buckley, but, like, what was his dog like? Uh, yeah, that was for How Rich Is That Doggy in the Limo. Um, and uh, if... Uh, What's sad is it was supposed to be making fun of these people who put their pets on the diets on diets so they can fly first class on Air France, which had an 11 pound weight <laughs> limit. If your dog uh, is too fat, you can't. <laughs> yeah, and but but everyone just like page six picked it up and thought it was delightful. So <laughs> I got a little meaner with my next one, which was called "Too Rich and Too Thin," which was about society women who were both. Is this like the correlation between like your apartment is fancier if you're like more... Right, it was... Um, short. A, a size 2 gets a 14-room apartment and a size 14 gets a 2-room <laughs> apartment. <laughs> I can't even visualize what a 14-room apartment would look like. So, uh, but... Oh, another oh, question. question. Oh, sir, gentlemen. Sorry, just invisible. Um, <laughs> I, I, I got a question that... Um, sort of touches on a lot of things you've brought up about politics. Would it be okay if we interrupted you? <laughs> you just to try as, to even the score. As long as you explain it to me while you're doing it. So. <laughs> I'm cool with that. But, you know, about politics, comedy, sexism, so um, this may be a little bit awkward, but do you have any advice for Al Franken who sort of got swept up in a tsunami and now is kind of in limbo? Well, I hope he comes back. In, in some form, on TV, maybe, or I don't know. But anything, any sort of path you could... No, I, I actually, I don't know him. We were both at Gary Shandling's memorial, and I was with my friend Meryl Marco, and I said, do you know uh, Al Franken? And she said, yeah. I said, would you introduce me? And he said, she said, no, he'll just hit you up for money. <laughs> so I said, all right, I'll I'll pass. <laughs> Oh, no, no more I, I do think it's funny because people always are like, well, 
Al Franken's like, it's unfair that his career is over. I'm like, we don't know that it's over. He's still alive. Like, yeah. <laughs> it is very possible that he will continue to have a career. And so everyone's like, it's gone. It's done forever. Like, it has gone too far. It's like, has it? it maybe it hasn't. Time is still, there, there's future time as well as past time. Um, it was kind of weird that he became a senator in the first place. So. No weirder than some of the other people have been elected. Well, that's true. <laughs> yes, Son Sonny Bono was... <laughs> yeah. He, he was in uh, yeah, well. um, uh, something you touched on this evening and, then, and, then, and also throughout the book is uh, how you respond to notes from uh, often clueless uh, executives. And so I was hoping that you could talk a little bit more about that and how you find a way to balance sort of your integrity with <laughs> having to be nice to them. So one of the pieces of advice in the book... Um, came from a friend of mine named Amy Hone, who told me the only way to move forward creatively is to allow yourself to be judged. And what she meant is it's not what you start or even what you finish, it's what you put out there for others to see. And it's hard because you've, you've got, you know, nobody likes to hear that what they've done isn't perfect, um, but that's, you know, that's the way you move forward. And then the other piece of advice for getting notes was a friend of mine who went to Berkeley um, gave me the advice they gave the protesters, which is go limp. <laughs> <laughs> and which is you, you take it, you absorb it, and, and then, um, you know, you... It's so subjective comedy that uh, I had... My very first script was for Newhart, the final season, I was there when Suzanne Plachet woke up with Bob Newhart in bed. And the number two guy stopped by my office and said, great job. Just great job, really funny. Um, and he went to meet with his bosses and came back 20 minutes later and said they hated it. Uh, but it was actually a great example of how subjective it was. And I was so grateful he had come in first and, and so then I just worked with him to make them happy. Um, yeah. What, what is the weirdest note you've ever gotten where you're like, this just doesn't even make sense given what I gave you? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I wish there's that book, like a Martian wouldn't say that. I, I wish I had <laughs> one of those, like, great missing the point. Uh, I, I know. So once I was on a show called Coach, which starred Craig T. Nelson, and we had written ourselves into the corner by getting him engaged to his longtime girlfriend, who was played by Shelley Fabre, and we realized we needed to break them up. So I'm the only female in the room, and someone comes up with this idea that Craig T. Nelson will just go to her and say, I've decided I don't want to get married, and she'll say, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So I decide to speak up and go, you know, I really think he's, he needs to come up with something better. And, and I don't, can't imagine any woman just saying, okay. And they all shouted me down. And I remember one guy said, um, uh, my wife would be fine with that. <laughs> and <laughs> I wasn't quite sure how That's to take really that. Because <laughs> also when you were writing for NCIS, you had this script that you turned in, which explains how NCIS works. Uh, oh, yeah, that's a great story. You had, like, three acts of it, and the fourth act, he was like... He said, he, he said, I like acts, teaser one through three, but I want a new killer. And I said, so I should rewrite the script? And he said, no, just change act four. And I said, well, you know all the clues are going to point to the other guy. But then when it aired, people loved it, and they were like, I had no idea that was a killer. <laughs> I'm like, that makes so much sense. That explains it does. every NCIS episode I've ever seen. Because I was tracking, I was tracking, and then boom. So that's like a reassuring note to see. I mean, I, yeah, I, th I thought I'm like, are you questioning? Yes. Um, uh, kind of building off the last question, I really enjoyed the recent Muppet show that you worked on. Oh, good. And um, it seems like there's a lot of discord between Disney and the veteran Muppeteers about who the Muppets are and what makes them work, and Frank Oz just weighed in. I was wondering if you could yeah. weigh in on, on what you thought makes the Muppets special and how they can work. Oh, love. No, um, <laughs> oh, it's, uh, it, 
it's complicated, and I think what our show got wrong was that um, I was the only upper level female on that show, and the men didn't appreciate Miss Piggy. You know, they thought she was crazy, and I said, "There's, she is so focused. Like, I think crazy is like scattered, and like she knows what she wants, which is all the oxygen in the room. <laughs> um, and so I think that was a huge mistake. We just, um, they, and she's such a central character that they, the guys didn't understand. She's a diva. Yeah. Yeah, but for reason. I mean, she's, she deserves it. She worked hard for that. Yeah. And you wrote the episode where, like, her tail becomes visible. And yeah, so, oh, um, my, what, maybe my second day there, I went up to Bill Beretta, who's, like, king of the Muppets and just a crazy, talented guy. And he, he does the voice of Pepe, the King Prawn, and he, he directs <laughs> a lot of it. And I said to him, does Miss Piggy have a tail? And he said, I suppose... Yes, yes, she has a tail. And I said, have we ever seen it? And he said, no. And I said, could we see it? Um, and he got a little sparkle in his eye. And I came up with a story where Miss Piggy's on the red carpet at a film premiere and has a wardrobe malfunction. <laughs> She's got this low cut dress and she turns to pop for the photographer and out comes the tail. And um, I, I'm just so proud I added to it's Muppet canon. canon. <laughs> exactly. There's now a fact there that wasn't there well, before. And it became an episode about body shaming. And it, it was sort of like this nip slip. And everyone wants her to apologize. And she has this epiphany, though, that um, Fozzie's tail is out. And nobody has a problem with that. <laughs> and, that and Rizzo's tail is out. And, yeah. and so Double um, standard. she starts a hashtag. Muppet's nude all the time. <laughs> And no one ever says anything. Um, her hashtag is unveil the tail. <laughs> <laughs> Release, yeah. Well, speaking of Frank Oz, so as like a massive Star Wars nerd, it says you wrote some of this at Lucasfilm, at like Sky, Skywalker Ranch. I did Ranch. work at Skywalker Ranch. So I, I become friendly with George Lucas and Melody Hobson. And uh, I found it was hard to write this in LA. And, and there was something about being a way that gave me distance that I needed. Because you can't be like in the coffee shop and then there goes, right. oh no, there's Ben and that, No, and someone's writing the script next to you and you're going, wow, I wonder if I'll ever work in Hollywood again. Yeah. <laughs> Jesse, can I work in Hollywood again? Jesse worked on NCIS with me. Yeah, I was going to announce that full confession. I was there during that <laughs> episode. Uh, and I believe it was, was it the one about the automatic car? That was the episode? No. No, this was the one about the poisoning. The, the, we ripped off that great old movie, DOA, where a guy walks in in the teaser and says, I want to report a murder of who? Me. Yeah, that it was, was radium poisoning. And I pitched it before, like two months later, that guy actually died of radium poisoning. Yeah, you were ahead of the curve on I was. <laughs> but I, I, was think, I was remembering, I believe you wrote the line for Lauren Holly in the car episode that was, are you telling me there's a killer robot Humvee loose on the streets of Washington, D.C.? <laughs> Which put us at number one for the first time ever. Okay, so this, this is a great story because this was an episode, our, our boss kept saying he was going to write an episode for a slot and he'd read us scenes from it, but the actual script never materialized. So at the last second... He pulled a script from his desk that had been there since the year before, and he threw it at me, literally threw it at me, and said, rewrite this over the weekend. This will be our next script. And it was about a killer car from DARPA that appears to be murdering people. So oh, I, I do a pass, and then he likes the first half, and he gives it to another guy to do a pass, and he rewrites the last two. We all end up sharing credit. It is the biggest mess that my name has ever been on. So when it airs, I don't tell anyone. I don't tell my family. I don't tell my agent. It's the only time my name's been on an episode that ranked number one for the week. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Hollywood. <laughs> and uh, on that note, uh, thank you so much for doing oh, this. Oh, thank you. And thank you all for coming.